Oh, I'm rolling. Hey, so what's up, dudes and dudettes and circles and human beings and aliens? My name is Neil Patterson, and this is my podcast, Subcast. I don't know what episode this is. I think it's number 60. Let me check real quick. But right now I'm recording the intro to my podcast, and I'm getting back on the horse. And But I have to make this quick because I have to go to bed because I have to work in the morning. I'm helping out my boy. I know this guy, Ron, and we scoop dog shit. And that's what I've been doing for a little supplemental income. Now, if you think that I'm the type of dude that should be doing something better with my life than scooping dog shit in order to get monetary units, I want to tell you about my Patreon. Yes, Patreon is a subscription type service where if you sign up for it and pay on a monthly basis, you will get perks and you will get certain content before anyone else does. Like, in fact, I'm going to post this podcast under the Patreon before I post it onto the YouTube for the world to see. And this is a very special episode. This episode is with Mr. Mikey Clark, who is a world-renowned and platinum record producer from the city of Detroit, Michigan. And he produced a little group called Insane Clown Posse, and Esham, and George Clinton, and this dude you may have heard of named Bob Ritchie, a.k.a. Kid Motherfucking Rock. He had Mikey Clark worked with him, and I had a conversation with him, and it was super cool. But right now, let me pop on this Patreon. I just want to shout out our patrons because, you know, it's fluctuated a little bit. But right now, I'm getting a little bit of supplemental income from Patreon. Right now, we have 17 patrons. And I tell you what, I tell you what, if we got about a million people to sign up for $5 a month to get the special patron exclusive exclusives, that would be like... What's a million times five? Five million. I'd be making five million dollars a month, which would be pretty sweet. I wouldn't have to scoop dog shit anymore. So anyway, right now I want to give a shout out to our lovely patrons who are helping uh, keep me fed because, yo, dog shit cleaning only pays so many of the bills. I, ha- I kind of am a jerk of all trades. I got some stuff going on, but but oh yeah. But anyway, blah 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 blah. Thank you to our patrons who make this subcast possible: Mr. Willis Smith, Justin Lonstein, John Voorhees, Christopher Willig, Chad Anderson, uh, Capricious AF, Baby Run, Matt Baby Run Rundell, Nick Schwartz, Jason Crenshaw, Chris Kachowski, Big Chris, Front Runner. Jamie Parker, John Brock, Brad Woodberg, Andrew Savard, 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 I don't know how to pronounce that, Bob Ashton, and the one and only Wendy Ikes, or Ikes, how do you pronounce your last name, Wendy, I do not know, so anyway, this is the intro of the podcast, and I'm going to make it short and sweet, I just ate dinner, and I spent most of the day helping my mom plant grass, And this is what life in Michigan is. I'm spending a lot of time doing regular-ass Michigan shit. And I'm trying to be patient with myself, play some Final Fantasy VI, get high, spend time with my girlfriend, and uh, spend time with my nephew. In fact, it was weird yesterday. I spent about a half an hour throwing a lawn dart into a tree to try and retrieve a Frisbee, one of those, like frisbee that is made out of the stretchy material that um it, you know you can like bounce it and throw it you, you know what i'm talking about it's like made out of some sort of material it's a frisbee that you like throw in the pool and it floats it's very lightweight i don't know what those kind of frisbees are but anyway i threw it up into a tree and my seven-year-old nephew is like you're dumb he told me i was the worst thrower and i agreed with him and uh, then he's like, well, you got to get, tr- the, get the Frisbee out of the tree. And I'm like, how am I going to do that? So I got on a ladder with a leaf blower trying to get it out of the tree. That didn't work. And then we started throwing stuff at it. And he, my nephew was like, here's a lawn dart. And I th- just started throwing a lawn dart at the Frisbee that was stuck in the tree. And I threw it about 75 times. And every time I got a little bit closer until victory. And that, you know, that's the kind of stuff I do with my life now. I I haven't been making very many podcasts. I've been trying to make like goofy TikToks and shit, but ultimately what it comes down to is all of the content that I would make is, uh, I don't know. I'm just kind of living my life and I'm doing shit when I feel it. So it's been like three weeks since the last podcast, but this is a good one. This is a good one. So strap yourselves in. This is 
the fucking Mikey Clark interview. And according to Mikey Clark himself, this is one of the first interviews he's done in like almost a decade. And he did it with your boy, me, Neil P. And also, another weird thing that's happening on Friday, I'm taking a plane and I'm going to New York City to sing for Reagan Youth again. Yes, Reagan Youth, the legendary New York hardcore punk band from the 80s. They keep hiring me to be their singer. And I think we might do an album. I don't know what the fuck is going to happen. So life is weird. And shows are coming back. And people are vaccinated. And there might be a tour in the fall. There might be a show on 4th of July. I'm going to sing for Reagan Youth on Saturday, May 22nd in Tompkins Square Park. Right by the old A7. And on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. I mean, it's getting weird. I'm starting to travel. Starting to do regular shit again. Some some of these podcasts might be back in the van again. Remember when this podcast was a van cast? Yeah, that might come back. So these are exciting times. Um, you know, I'm thinking maybe I can stop taking the antidepressants. Or it's one of those things that's funny, though. like you, you're on antidepressants, and then your life starts getting good, and then you're like, oh, I don't need to take these anymore. And then you stop taking them, and then you realize that the antidepressants were like your only window into happiness. Or who knows? Maybe like it was situational. Maybe that depression and maybe my terrible mood and all that shit that happened when I got back on the drugs in December of 2020. Maybe all of that was situational. Maybe it didn't really have to do with the chemical imbalance. Maybe I just was like really fucking miserable being in a COVID prison. And maybe now that I'm getting out of that COVID prison, I don't need the pills. Or maybe I should just continue to take the pills. I don't know. I'll, I'll discuss that with my uh, psychologist and my significant other and my mother. And, you know, we'll have a little powwow about it. But anyway, I'm blabbing. i um, going to New York. Uh, sign up for the Patreon. If you bl- enjoy this podcast and you want to support me and you don't want me doing terrible shit like scooping dog shit. If you'd rather have me just making content full time instead of having to do menial uh, manual labor in order to pay my bills, then consider signing up for the Patreon. You help me and you help yourself because I'm gonna, I'm getting back, baby. I'm gonna give you that good old content. I got a bunch of interviews set up with a bunch of very interesting people, and we're gonna learn about life together. We're gonna open doors and we're gonna close doors, and then we're gonna walk downstairs and then we're gonna walk upstairs and. I'm going to go watch that show, Invincible, that features the voice of J.K. Simmons. Because from what I hear, it's quite a good program on Amazon. So yeah, everything's fucking weird. But I think life is sort of in a weird way getting back to normal. So these are exciting times. My mom is still alive. COVID didn't take her. And she survived a whole year by herself in a house. By herself with nothing but her dogs. And I'm back in Michigan. And... I'm trying not to eat pizza every week. But damn, Jets pizza is good. Okay, so uh, that's it. Let's get to the fucking interview. Here we go. This is the Mike E. Clark interview. I'm Neil P. And this is my podcast. Sup, 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 cast, sup, cast, and I'm out. Enjoy. Enjoy. So, so is this the new studio? Yeah, new control room. Hell yeah! What's the what's the name of the new studio? Um, Funhouse. Still Funhouse. The relocated Funhouse. Yeah, in the woods. Funhouse in the woods. <laughs> okay, I'm rolling on my end, so we can. Yeah, do- yeah. So, yeah, man, I um, I built new control room. I moved out, sold my old house, sold my studio two years ago. Got the fuck out, and uh, I got five acres in the Huron National Forest, and I don't have any neighbors, and uh, I've been quarantined for about two years now. I was quarantined a year before this shit even started, so... You got a head start. I was was ahead of y'all, and I rebuilt, I've just built my studio, been working on, you know, I got eight buildings, five acres, so it's a lot of work. So just uh, got off the road 
and now I live here. And uh, now, finally, after two years, I got my studio built, got my shit together. I'm starting to release material, start working on music again. Uh, built a greenhouse, so I'm growing food and keeping really fucking busy. Was it some sort of <laughs> was it some sort of intuition that you felt? Where you were like, I'm gonna get the fuck out of here. Like, do you? Yeah, I planned it. You know, I knew what I was gonna do like five, six years ago. So I thought the Kid Rock tour. I went out with him until two. You know, till I quit in 2019, and I quit because I sold my place downstate. And uh, when I move up to the compound, it's like two and a half hours to the airport. And I'm like, I'm not driving two and a half hours to go to the airport to fly out for a gig. So I quit that. And then I've been up here. And then literally, not, I don't even know, maybe a year later, the pandemic hit. And um, I was already, you know, good out. So, yeah. I mean, timing couldn't even have been better. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew I knew I wanted to do because I had both properties. I had this property for 20 years. I knew I always wanted to live here. This is where I want to live the rest of my life. So just uh, always just making the plan, working. And the last hurrah was fun. You know, four years out on a row with Kid Rock. You know what? I mean, come on. I was insane. <laughs> and you were saying like, I had the most fun of my whole entire life. But you know what I mean? By the fourth or fifth year, you know, it's like, OK, I did this. I went you know, how much fun can you have? You know? So like I was done and, uh, I was ready to be here, you know? So then I just got this place together, start building my studio, redid my home. Cause it was just more like a cabin. So I got, uh, got it all insulated, new roof. So that took a lot of time and then built a greenhouse and then, uh, got a wood shop art studio so now it's like literally the last uh, six months, I'm starting to get back into the studio again, making tracks. Plus, I got a whole back catalog of shit for the last 25 years. Yeah. Un unreleased stuff. And so I've been archiving, going through that stuff. I got like thousands of old cassettes with rough mixes. So I've been going through that. You know, I got a huge record collection going through that shit, CDs, just after you move all this shit, you know, then it takes a couple years to go through it. You know, I still got like two storage units full of shit, you know? So, um, yeah, this has been my full-time job for last two years, you know, but it feels good now. Like my studio's up and running. Everything's like, I got everything I need, sold a bunch of stuff that I didn't need, took that money, bought stuff that I want. And uh, I feel like right now I'm starting like a whole new book. Yeah, dude. Not even a new chapter. Like, <laughs> that's all. I'm writing a book. Right, I'm starting to write a book, which is going to take me a year or two to get it all down. I'm going to get that written. But now this is like the beginning of a new, new book, really new life. But uh, super excited, you know. That is exciting. And, yeah, yeah. And it, yeah, it definitely is a process. I know just from moving, because I was in LA and I moved back to Michigan like uh, in February and it's been a slow go getting shit going. Like getting, I, you know, I had my podcast, I was doing once one a week and now I'm doing like one every three weeks. I'm just trying to help out my mom, hanging out with my nephew, you know, just doing regular yeah. people shit. Just life shit, you know? It's like, man, I can't like, you know, you wanted to do this. I mean, I haven't done an interview in years because just haven't had time and there would be nothing to talk about. Oh, I unpacked like some boxes today. <laughs> uh, I bought another saw because the one I bought, I have is packed away. I can't find it. You know, that's the worst when you have two of something and then you can't find either one of them. You got to <laughs> buy it again, you know, shit like that. So, but right now I'm, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm in a zone. I'm getting in, I'm, I'm feeling like I can relax. I can kind of, you know, don't have to worry about, um, you know, just the compound shit stuff around. Like I, I've got it, my shit tight, you know? Yeah. And so, now, now that you're comfortable, it's, it's 
it's probably easier for creative things to happen because you're not thinking about all the other shit you got to do. You're just like, okay, and maybe some ideas. And Absolutely. Like for my, for me, my studio has to be perfect. Like every, I can't think about anything technical when I'm being creative. So if there's a glitch in anything, I'll tear it all apart, rewire it all. And then like, it, it it's almost like that's all I've been doing for two years. It's just like wiring up my studio, then tearing it all apart, redoing it again. Blah, blah, blah. This is like three. I just finished it last week. And now it's perfect. Like, I got it the way I want it. So now I can come in and throw down and not have to worry about or think about, um, oh, man, if I had that patch bay set up better over there or if, you know. So, you know, making that right is uh, helps me with my brain, you know. I don't have to think about that shit. Everything else around the compound is all fucked up. You know, <laughs> Nothing's per- nothing is perfect. My greenhouse, whatever, it's not perfect, but it's fucking it's fine. But when it comes to the studio, when the gear, it's all got to be, I got to have it synced up. I got to have it routed into the console. I got to know where it's at. I can not have downtime because then I'll get frustrated and I won't even do, I'll walk out. So um, I'm at that point, you know, like I know I could come in here in like 10 minutes, throw something really dope down, you know. Yeah, because nothing's going to get in the way of that. Like Right, right. Similarly, like with all this streaming shit, when the pandemic hit and all the video content I've been making, uh, I had to... I had to learn so much. There was like a, a, a year long learning curve that I'm at the end of where I finally shit's working the way I wanted to. Yes. Like there's not a delay in the audio and I can get like 5,000 millibytes per second upload speed. And I had to change my internet and just a bunch of, you know, technical jargon, but it, it fucks with you. Cause when you're in the moment and you're trying to make some shit, it get, it like, and something fucks up, it just throws you completely off. At least that's what it does to me. Absolutely. And that's, that's the same. It is with the, um, in the studio, you know, like I have to have all my guns loaded, you know, my palette full of the paint that I'm going to f- use and it's got to be there. If I want red, I need red now. Wow. You know, I can't start moving cables around and, and doing all that. I just then then I, you know, I love doing that, but that's a different person. So I get that shit out of the way. And then I want to come in here, cut a vein, be totally creative i can be that guy but if i got those other little um you know monkey wrenches getting thrown at me i'll shut it down that's like oh man i just i hooked it all up i thought it was perfect then i needed a patch bay i go this all this shit's got to go back on the patch bay (laughs) so then it was like (laughs) it's crazy you know but now i feel so good um that I can, I know I can uh, move forward. So, but all that time I've been doing a lot of stuff, cataloging old material. I put out a bunch of CDs just the last couple months. Um, just getting the getting the feel of it, you know, getting the website up. Um, and then, man, I just I just want to keep creating, put new new records out. Um, started up my old uh, techno label, Pulsar Recordings which I left off in 97. So I just put out a new 12 inch. Well, it's not actually 12 inch. It's digital, but a new um, EP put that out last week. So I got that going and I got the Mikey Clark stuff going and uh, I'm going to start writing, writing for people start throwing people. A lot of people's off, off, often ask, ask me if I got tracks and shit. And I'm just like, uh, I ain't got time to have it right now, but now is the time where I think I can, uh, maybe get in, get into, uh, some of that, you know, the flow state. Well, well, real quick, like let's rewind a little bit. I'm here and I, cause I didn't even introduce you, man. I'm here with the fucking legendary producer, weirdo, <laughs> eclectic, fun guy, Mr. Mikey Clark. Detroit legend, and uh, yeah, dude, it, it, I, we've known each other for probably like a little over 15, 16, maybe even 17 years at this point, but it's... Uh, yeah, it's been, a, it's been a while. When I first fucking met you, I remember our mutual friend Sterling invited me to uh, your birthdays on Christmas every year, and you would, at the Fun House, you would have like a jam session party on your birthday, and I remember just... 
Because when I was a little kid and I first started smoking weed, I was like 15 years old. I was listening to like Carnival of Carnage and Ringmaster and stuff. This was in, in like 94. And, yeah. And so th- th- like I, those records changed me in a way because I'm like, I'm like, wow, like you can be super fucking creative. You could be funny and you could be really weird and do something with it. So I was super inspired and and. Yeah, it, the shit was fresh as hell, and I remember listening to Carnival of Carnage with my friends, smoking weed before school, and rolling on the ground, laughing our asses off because we just we thought it was the funniest, weirdest shit we ever heard. It was, so, what was, that? was Bugs on my nugs on that, or that was on Ringmaster? That w- that was Ringmaster. That that song still gets me. Man. <laughs> that, that song is so fucking funny, but um. I don't, I don't, Carnival, I don't, I don't know what was on that. I haven't heard it in so long. Night of the Axe, uh, the, the Juggler. Oh, Juggler. Was Juggler on that? Yeah, the Juggler. Yeah. Dan it, Dan it. Like my beats were so, I was, didn't even know what I was doing. I, I love those beats. I, I, I can't listen to it, man. It's just like, I can't listen to it because it's so, um, I just like, I don't know, man. Ring Ringmaster, like it took me a while to be able to go back and listen to Ringmaster till I go, oh, I get it now. But when it was all happening, <laughs> I was like, I don't know, man. You know, no, it's it's hard to go. I did for me to just I, I have a hard time listening to my own shit anyway. Right. So like, I I'm get just, that. I live in the moment. You know, like I do something, do it, get it out, gone. I don't care. I now I want to do the next thing. You know. It's hard to go back, but when I do go back, I do get surprised. You know, like I'll hear something off Bizarre or I'll hear something off like even Mighty Death Pop or whatever. Um, any of that, you know, and I go, whoa, whoa. If I can step outside of myself and listen to it, I, I can um, appreciate it a little bit more. But when it's you who did it and then you're listening to it, it's you just hear into it too much you know you're not hearing it so much as the whole song you're hearing like oh why did i why didn't i do this or why you know like you're constantly critiquing and ripping it apart even if it's like 20 years old like let it go so now like if you let a lot of time go don't listen to it for years and years then when you do hear it you can kind of step outside of yourself and appreciate it out of someone else's ears or even like if you're working on a new track and you might think it's the shit in the studio and then you bring somebody in to listen to it. You hear it out of their ears and then you're like, Oh fuck, this is fucked up. Or you might be like, Oh, it's fucking great. You might even like it more after you listen to it out of someone else's ears. And it's just by being them being in the room. Um, you know, that's kind of tripped out. Cause I'm the, my worst critic. Like I'll do something and hate it and just like, Oh, it's garbage. But uh, I won't throw it away. I always keep everything because there's a lesson that I learned early on, um, which I'll tell you. But I'll keep stuff. So then when I li- and then I'll load it back up and listen to it like three months later and go, who the fuck did this? This is fucking great. <laughs> but, but you can work on it so long to where you get sick of yourself and you don't like it anymore. So I know not to trust myself a lot of times. I know if I just like do what I feel, get it down. And try not to be my worst critic um, is usually a good idea. Um, and that being said, I'd say like out of 10 things I do, one I'll release, you know. So there's a lot of, you know, I call it it's like the lifesaver situation where, you know, you're working on a track, not feeling it. Oh, this is the pineapple, but you got to finish it. And then the next track you do. Ah, this is the green one. Ah, finish it. Then next one might be that cherry. Right, right. Oh, so, so you got to go through the whackness. You got to do a, You got to do like five sucky ass tracks. But don't don't beat yourself up. Just say, okay, I'm doing a sucky ass track. Just but go through the motions. You know what I mean? That's <laughs> that's how I kind of work. And sometimes you go back to those tracks that you think suck while you're working on them, and then you're mildly surprised. You're like, oh. No, that is really good. Or it might be, you know, better, you know, a lot better than you thought it was. Or a lot of times you'll listen to it and you just like horrified how awful you are. You know. 
or can be. So, but like the 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 thing why I don't throw anything like I would be working on stuff for the most part. I won't throw it away. Um, was I had dead body man. I was I was living in an apartment in Royal Oak back in '94, uh, and I just had a little bedroom and I had my stuff set up in the bedroom. That's where we recorded two dopes. Um, fuck off EP. Right, right. But also Terror Wheel was done right around there. Anyhow, had S two S one thousands or S one thousand whatever, and I did the track the Dead Body Man like that fucking sick ass track. And I remember I got so sick of myself and so sick of what I was doing because I was working on it for hour, few hours, whatever. I'm going. To, I'm tired. I'm going to go to bed. Right. I fucking on the S1000, if you hit the power button to turn it off, because I was just going to shut this shit off and get rid of it. I push the button in. I'm going to power off. Goodbye, dead body man. It's gone. I wasn't called that. It was just a track. And then I had my finger pushed in. And if you, on the S1000, the early S1000, the first Akai sampler, one of the first, if you push the button in, if you let go, the power goes off, right? Right, but if you push the button in, and you pull out and push back in real quick, it stays on. So what I did, I'll never forget this. I push it in, and I'm like, and I'm holding it there, and I'm like, "Am I? Should I just? Should, maybe I should just wait till tomorrow morning and listen to this shit." So I went, bum, bum, and it stayed on. Went to bed. Woke up next morning. Hit play on the fucking sequencer, and it's like, dun, 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 boom, psh, dun. and I was like, holy fuck, I was gonna toast this. I'm, that might be the fucking freshest <laughs> beat I ever did. And I was my, like, seriously, and after that, I was afraid of myself. I said, okay, fucker, do not throw anything away. Like, even if you think it sucked, because usually, you work on something for like an hour, two hours, whatever. There, it goes like this. Yay, it's great. It's great. It's great. And then you start getting tired of it and sick of it. And then you think it sucks. Yeah. Usually it always happens to me. So I have to learn when to not uh, listen to, or trust myself. And then, uh, I don't know. That's, that's, that's what happened. <laughs> yeah, I feel like it, similarly, it, it reminds me of... Uh, Sometimes you get a live recording of a show that you think was a total piece of shit, and I and I know from just from being in the band and playing gigs, but then you like listen back and you're like, oh, and you're like it's not that bad. We were on point that night. You know, so many times, like I would go see um, my friends, you know, because I was recording a bunch of bands like Trash Brats. I'd I'd go see them all the time, and I'd go. I was such a fucking fan, you know. Um, they would do an amazing show. And then after the show, I would run backstage. And I'd go like, what the fuck? That was fucking amazing. And they're all like salty and like, that was the worst show we ever did. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And they go, this is horrible. And I go, what the fuck do you know? I was right out in front. I heard it. I was there. I'm the fan. No, and I, I, I couldn't believe like how they, you know, and I'm not saying RV trash I'm just saying it's happened like maybe once with them, but other bands that were friends of mine. You go back, you thought they did a kick-ass show. Everybody got into it. And the band, from their perspective on being on stage, maybe their fucking monitor wasn't right or whatever yeah, the yeah. fuck. Um, they missed it. You know, they missed the... Um, they didn't get it. But um, like you said, though, you go back and listen to the live tape. And you're like, wait a minute. That was pretty good. So I think you're, you're worse critic especially if when you're performing you got a lot of things coming at you yeah yeah you, know, you got a lot coming at you and uh yeah it's hard to uh you know judge yourself so, i mean it's not hard to judge yourself it's easy easy but as fuck sometimes, yeah. I, sometimes i think we beat ourselves up a little bit too much you know where or take ourselves too serious or go okay whatever so what i fucking missed the chord who cares the audience didn't matter and then you're going to bitch at the whole fucking band because somebody missed a chord or something when it doesn't really fucking matter. Nope. So then you're going to wreck your night because you're mad. I mean, I've seen this time and time again. And then everyone's all pissed off, salty, but fucking hurt feelings. 
for and then really what the fuck for and then you you missed the you missed the moment you didn't get to enjoy something that anyone would kill to be up and do you know it's like years it's like years of my life was me just fucking finding a reason to be pissed off every night about the like uh, us not getting something in the green room or fucking the drive being too long or you know just ha- having a really negative spin on everything and I think what it comes down to is is being aware of that perspective and that whole grass is greener thing and and trying to put yourself in other people's shoes and think about like Hey, you know, we're in a band on the road, but we're a small band and not a lot of people give a fuck. But dude, like there's years of my life where all I did is drive around and play music and that's the shit. But the whole time I was just like, we should be bigger. We should be doing this, you know, and and like being salty about it. So I spent years just being a salty motherfucker, you know? Yeah. And, um, you know, it comes a time and you got to enjoy that shit. This is all we got, you know, we'll be dead soon. You know, this is it. Today is, you know. It's, you know, this could be the last day, you know. So I live every, like, that's how I live every day, you know, is a gift. I, uh, I'm lucky to be here. And every day I get up, man, I'm happy and try not to beat myself up. Usually I get half done of what I plan to get done every single day. Yeah, I know that. <laughs> but I don't get mad at myself. I'm like, oh, shit, why didn't you get, like, I just think I try to expect, I try to do too much. I think I'm going to do all this stuff. I got big ideas. You know? Right, right. I'm going to build my cabinet. I'm going to build this, like, you know, I'm going to get this painted. I'm going to da 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 And then I get, like, literally a half of it done. At the end of the day, I go, oh, shit, I didn't get the cabinet painted. Oh, fuck. I, would, I go, okay, well, fuck it. I'll do it tomorrow. So, And that's something I've been trying to be nicer to myself and more patient with myself lately. It's like, dude, you're just a dude, and you're trying your best, and... You know, you haven't taken over the world and you probably aren't going to. So just chill the fuck out and quit telling yourself you suck all the time. <laughs> right. You know, you have to like you got to live in the moment. You got to enjoy whatever you're doing, whether you're just walking, you know, through the woods or whatever, whatever you're doing. You kind of just need to be there for that and any task you're working on and not go into the don't think about the past. Don't get into the past make you depressed stay out of the future you're gonna get anxiety like a motherfucker whenever you get that's how i check myself i'm feeling anxious and all this shit i'm like where's your head i'm thinking about next week next month what i'm you know like you know it's okay you know prepare you know hope for the best prepare for the worst but yeah but you know if it's when you can try to like zero in and stay in the moment and that's why like i don't meditate i want to i i mean i would i should but that's why meditation is so great because it it gets you out of your head you know sometimes it's like you know it'll wreck you you know if you're up all up in your own head you know it'll fucking make you crazy and it'll just bum you out <laughs> so i don't know i live in the moment yeah and that, that's something when my dad died i started going to therapy and uh a gratitude is something that my therapist and i i still have a really hard time doing it because as grateful as i am for all the cool shit that i have i'll still find nine things that i'm like oh i wish i had this or if only i had this and and why don't i have this i deserve this and and but I'm, I'm really trying harder these days to, yeah, be be mindful, live in the moment, and just be like, I'm looking around right well, now. With, Go ahead, dude. Well, the older you get, you know, you that will always, that comes into play, you know, if you're lucky, you know, it should, um, you know, but it do, that does come along with age, you know, where you start to mellow out and you're like, okay. Maybe I don't need to freak out about <laughs> this shit that doesn't <laughs> really, really fucking matter. Yeah. Or take everything yeah. so goddamn personal. You know, it's just that like, too. you know, it's like, it ain't, a lot of things aren't really even about you, you know, where, you, you know, you take it personal and it's like, you know what I'm saying? And then that's just being um, young, you know, naive. And now it's like, you know, I just don't, the best thing is like, don't care. Like the best, <laughs> the best thing to me, like, I just, I don't care. I just like, don't care. And then if something's going 
making you upset or whatever, just saying I don't fucking care makes you feel better. Even if you do, like if something's really bugging you, someone did something that's bothering you or something. But if you can just go, I don't care. Like you will, it does relieve some steam, like not caring <laughs> about some stupid shit can really uh, help you get on with your day. Yeah. Just, and you know, I've cared about a lot of dumb shit over the years. Right. And what <laughs> did it matter? You know, like a lot of things, Nothing. Man, it, like, it doesn't fucking matter. I don't know. You're here. I'm just glad to fucking get up in the morning and um, have a new day, have another day, you know? Amen, dude. So let's go back in time a little bit because I remember I, I read in Joe Bruce's book, you were at the temper mill when they first called you. Yeah. Now Yeah, that what I did is I was at I um I was working out of my basement. I was actually I was at the disc and then I got frustrated there. They wouldn't let me up in the I wanted to be up in the A room, a big studio, and they're like, You're not ready, you're not ready. So I started doing like little um, programming. I got a, that was like first motherfucker to get an MPC 60. Yeah. So I uh, started getting that, learning it, getting good at it, you know, figuring out how to sample and do cool shit. So I was in my basement in the laundry room <laughs> programming, programming beats for some, some of my clients for like, 20 10 20 dollars an hour or whatever and then uh dave was just opening up the temper mill and i went over there i said i got clients but we're in my basement you know it's like i got my washing machines in there and laundry, <laughs> and it's like it's kind of whack you know i just need a room but we don't have a lot of money you know i'm only you know you know so it's just young black teenagers you know it is doing rap it wasn't even called hip-hop i don't think it was just rap right but I had a little, I got a little crew, little follow, you know, some kids that, you know, was cool. Kid Rock came in. We did Yodel in the Valley in that damn laundry room. Oh, know? wow. Yeah. The whole so, record? No, just that, that single. Oh, just the single. Okay. But we just did the demo. We didn't do the single. We just did the demo, and then that got sent off. Okay. But, uh, so Dave's like, okay, well, I got this little room here. You could set up in here. Cause he was building the real studio in this other place. So, so that's what I did. I set that little room up. I have a picture of the room. You would crack up. If you saw it. <laughs> um, but I had all these old analog keyboards. I had my little MPC 60. I had a little, uh, task 24 cha channel mixer, whatever. It's all cheap shit and a microphone. And then I started, um, brought my, my clients there, and then we would just, you know, I'd lay down a beat down, they'd write their raps, boom, cassette, get put on a cassette, go home. I could have put a drive through window in the fucking place. <laughs> That's how fast I was rolling right. out. They come in, they book two hours for like 25 bucks an hour, 50 bucks. They're leaving with a cassette and a beat that I did, and their vocals on it. They don't give a fuck. They just throw that shit in their car, bump it with their friends at night. Like, you know, this is what we did in the studio today. Anywho, I was pretty booked up now. Like, I was a funky honky. All the kids, <laughs> they knew who I was. Because I, I got good really fast. And um, so, you, oh, man, you got to go the funky honky. You got to go the funky honky. <laughs> so I was recording, like, Jack Frost, Detroit's Most Wanted, Smiley. Um, these were all, like, underground um, shit in the early 90s, like 1990. Isham, um, who else? I don't know. Just whatever. So I'm busy as fuck now. Um, then I get this call, and it was ICP, and they're called like, "Yo, do you uh, do uh, rap or something?" I don't know how they got my number. They got my number somehow, and I was like really busy. I had somebody there like in the vocal booth, and <laughs> I'm like, "Yeah, man, you're, you're gonna call back." And they're like, "I'm trying to like get off the phone," and then they're just going on. And well, who have you done? Like, what what have you done? And I was like getting annoyed. I was like, man, everybody, everybody, Isham, Smiley. Like, I'm just rattling these names. <laughs> I did all this shit. Like, I go call me back, da da da, and we'll talk if you want to come see the studio or you want to come meet and see if this might be your situation, whatever. But I was kind of short with him as I remember. 
<laughs> and um, and then Joe even told me like afterwards, he goes, man, we were like, thought you were such a dick. Like we were just going to be like, fuck that kid, you know, whatever. But I wasn't trying to be a dick. I was just, I had someone in the vocal booth and I couldn't go on about my discography at the time. Yeah. You were working. I know I couldn't. I shouldn't. I was at work. The smart fucking thing is I should have let it go into the tape machine and let it, the voicemail, like, why did I answer the phone? So, you know, shame on me for answering the fucking phone when I couldn't talk. But sometimes it would be, usually be my, you know, somebody has got to bring some weed or something or that could have been the situation. We didn't have cell phones. Right. We didn't have computers either. So we weren't rocking computers. We were rocking half inch 16 track. (laughs) And, um, yeah, so that happened, and then so yeah, they show up. Well, they're, they had a, you know their manager or whatever, and uh, then the rest is history. They uh, they uh, dropped a, a, a track. You know, they paid for studio time in advance, which nobody did that. You know, they were like, "Well, here's you know five hundred dollars, just like five thousand dollars to me right now." <laughs> yeah. But. Um, their manager owned a record store, so I think he had some money where he could, um, whatever. So then I was just like, whoa, damn, okay. <laughs> so then that's when we started Carnival Carnage. And, um, yeah, yeah, and that was, the, um, that was the beginning of it, you know. Did it get to the point where you, when you were working with Joe and Joey where it became almost like you just blocked off your entire life? And just do Yeah. Well, what would happen with Colonel Connors? Like, we would all work on it together. Like, you know, we would be in the studio working on it together. And um, it was kind of. And then um, what happened after Carnival Carnage? Was it Ringmaster? There was no EP, I don't think. Then Ringmaster, we did Ringmaster. And then I ended up moving my. Because um, I hired this girl, Laura Grab, to be my assistant because I was getting slammed with clients. And instead of turning the money away, I just hired Laura and she could take the night sessions. So she was doing some of the stuff, just easing my baggage, you know, like maybe if I couldn't do be there, she would. And it was kind of cool. Well, anyway, I was getting hammered with the, the studio bills. It was costing a lot of money to just rent that space out at the temper mill. And I wasn't it seemed like I was working too much working a lot just kind of to pay what the rent was and it was just hard to keep yeah. that up so Laura and I got really frustrated and I'm crying to Laura you know it's after you know Prince Vincent and his boys got in a fight in the studio and I was just like I'm fucking done man I can't do this I can't do it I'm not making any money I'm working my ass off and uh, she goes, well, why don't you just move all this shit in my basement? She had a place right on Saratoga in Ferndale, like literally three blocks away. Right. I'm like, what? <laughs> so she goes, yeah, let's go look. So I get in the car and go look at her basement. It's fucking perfect. They had a fireplace in it. You know, it was perfect. Perfect. I just uh, throw up some black fabric, bring my machines in here. I can, we're, we're good to go. And she goes, you don't have to give me any, you don't have to pay me anything. Dope. She goes, just she goes, just let me use the gear. Cause she was into, uh, she's still making techno records to this day. Um, Laura grab, look her up, but I haven't seen her in 20 years, but anyhow, she, uh, so yeah, man. So I did that. And man, then it was on like donkey Kong. I was like making money, you know, not a lot, you know, just ghetto money, you know, just, it was a lot for me. Oh yeah. But I'm just saying, you know, $25 an hour adds up when you're a fucking punk kid and you know, whatever it's better than anything. So when, yeah, especially when you got good. And when that's you- when we did ringmaster. And then, uh, we had a little more, com- it was just a better vibe in that studio. Um, so ringmaster was done there and then that shit started blowing up. Um, that shit started blowing up. They started selling out venues, like and uh, uh, that was crazy. Was it, what was the question? I forgot. I think I ran over you. <laughs> well, I I was just saying, uh, and twenty five dollars an hour does add up, especially if you have no overhead. So that that was really cool of her to give you that space. That's the shit right there. Um, uh, oh, dude, yeah. And we had so much fun 
you know, her and I, um, we, I would make a, you know, three, four hundred dollars at night, and then we would just go to Myers at like one in the morning, two in the morning, and we would just like Christmas. We'd buy fucking habit trails. We'd go, <laughs> <laughs> fucking look at those hamsters let's get hamsters like we would just buy random shit and then we put it in the house or like just it was so crazy it was crazy <laughs> so that was some good times you know but then you know we did ring ringmaster and then uh then what happened was uh they're like hey mike you know we got a show at the ritz you know they just released ring, their ring mess might have been out i don't know it must have so they go we got a show will you come will you come i'm like yeah i'll come because sometimes they do shows i wouldn't even go right right so so i go yes i promise i promise i'll be there so it was in roseville a lot the fraser and grash it was the ritz um he used to be a bowling alley it used to be the rare cherry and then there's a grocery store so the parking lot was just massive parking lot prior to that it used to be a kmart so anyway it was called the ritz bands would play their heavy metal bands and whatever oh yeah so icp were gonna play at the ritz and i used to live when i was a kid i lived like right behind the ritz so my whole life i like that was my hood so i'm like fuck yeah let's go so i go by myself i'm late for the show I get to the I get to the parking lot. I get to the Ritz. See a cars. See a whole fuck like all the way to the grocery. Like cars, I couldn't even park. <laughs> and I'm like, what the fuck's going on here? I didn't. There must be something going on here. I, there was some other thing over there. I go, there must be something going on over there. Had no idea. Park get out and it's just crickets there's thousands of cars but there's no people so that's scary weird yeah. there's no people there's no people and i'm walking through the parking lot all these cars i'm like where where are these people why are these cars i get up there i go hey i'm mike clark i'm on the guest list blah 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 I'm like okay they check it out and i can see from the door like once they let me in that was all as far as i could go like literally I walk in and I can't go any farther and I just see a sea of heads. And then right at that second, I hear the intro that I did a few days ago for the show, like dah, 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 carnival music, or whatever. Right. And I'm like, Holy fuck. This is the show. These, all these motherfuckers are here <laughs> to see ICP. <laughs> this is my shit. So like it, it it fucking freaked the shit out of me is what it did because I didn't see it coming. Um, you had no idea. I had no idea. Wow. Um, so it was pretty much after that. They were like, um, what days do you have available? And it was just like whatever days I had available, they wanted. So, you know, whatever days I didn't want to work was basically so they pretty much bought all took all my time but you know me being me I don't like to just do one thing so I kept on like Jack Frost you know different things like clients that I really loved that I had a lot of fun working with there was a rap group called CAD coming in all directions I love those guys um they do like electronic booty shit and they're just the sweetest guys i loved hanging out with them so i would keep them I kept jack frost um and uh oh another guy named um uh, p groove and sleepy d were my favorite one of my favorite clients because they were so um, they're so great uh, i think that record's going for like 500 dollars on discogs right now if you oh can wow find it. but um so, but that was that. That was it, you know. At, right after Ring Ringmaster, um, it got serious with the fans for them, you know. And then uh, that's that's that was how. Then 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 we just kept doing it, you know. Um, what came after that? I don't know. Beverly Kills or something. 
I don't know. I think I think Kills was uh, the EP after Carnival. Yeah, because then it became like a, a they would release an album, then an EP, then an album, EP, album, EP, which was perfect formula. Um, and I think that's what Ishan was doing. So I think ICP just like learned that from Ishan. So while you're, can you hear me? Oh yeah. Okay, I, I just hit my keyboard. While you're. <laughs> Well, you do an album, right? While your album's out working it, you get in the studio and do EP, which is, that doesn't take that long. Then that sets you up for your next album. It just was genius, genius. And our EPs were amazing. Like Terror Wheel was such a great EP. Um, you know, the Cotton Candy Tunnel Love EP <laughs> was amazing. And it was so much fun doing the EPs. Once you got done with the album, then the EP, you, you wouldn't really take serious. You know, like, oh, let's just fucking do an EP. Yeah, yeah. And the EPs were always, since we had that, just like, oh, fuck it, this, da, da, da. Always had another, like, vibe to them where they were um, a lot of fun. You know, that Cotton Candy EP, um, Tunnel Love EP was one of my, had the most fun making that. Because you just go get crazy. And I bought all these porn records from this shop. They were, like, from 1960s porn records and there was like five of them i got about the whole catalog and super rare and the stupidest you know it's just i guess people would play these at parties and it's just like people having sex but they're just way too loud talking all the time like oh baby you know saying all right. stupid. <laughs> yeah. like, nobody would say if you were having sex you would never say anything like this stupid shit but it was the 1960s, you know, and it was like outrageous, I guess. But the records were hilarious. And when we would put that, we put a lot of that shit into the um, the Tunnel Love EP and we just laugh our fucking asses off. And then then we do Riddle Box, which is fucking that's a masterpiece. Like that record is one of my favorite ICP records. Agree. Um, agree. It just knocked. We just knocked it out. Like, boom, knock that shit out. Like, it was nothing. Um, then that started getting attention. That's when we got a record deal. You know, we got a um, deal with uh, Jive. And that was interesting. Um, that whole thing was interesting. And then, uh, and uh, what was after? Malenko was after. Yeah, Malenko Riddle. was after Riddlebox. Let's yeah, and Malenko, I have a really funny story about Malenko, how that happened. Well, Joe's like, okay, we're going to do the next record. He goes, we're going to need some tracks. Because now at this point, I was like, I can't have you in the studio when I'm making tracks. It's going to go a lot better. So like on um, Ring, not Ringmaster so much. They were there pretty much on Ringmaster. But on um, Riddlebox, the EPs, all that stuff, Malenko, I did the track. I was like, get out, of the, get out of here. Let me do the track. Here's the track. Pick out which ones you like. And then we'll work from there. Because I can't have anybody breathe. I, I, seriously, if I was going to work on a track right now, I couldn't. I wouldn't want anybody in the room. <laughs> I just can't. So, so it's like masturbating in front of somebody, I guess. I don't. I can't do it. Like, I feel I have that. To, you know, see what I'm saying? It's just like, that's what it feels to me. It's like, I, I can't work like that. It's hard for me. I have to be alone, which I figured that out. So Joe's like, give me some tracks. Give me some tracks. So I say, okay, go in my, go in my studio. And I knock out, you know, I just knock out like six, five, six, seven tracks, like all at once, like within a day or two. And I put them on cassette. I said, come pick up the cassette. We always put it in my mailbox. He'd come pick it up. And then I, and I call him next day. I go, which, which ones do you want to work with? Which ones did you write to? Which ones are you writing to? He goes, all of them. Dude, I'm writing to all of them. I'm like, what do you mean all of them? Because I did them all kind of the same, yeah. which that would make sense because they all fit together. And then that's when it all blew up in his head and he got the concept of, um, you know, the whole thing. So all the, so most of the songs on Riddlebox or on, on The Great Malenko, which went platinum, um, we had no idea that would ever happen. Um, we're done. Literally, I did those motherfucking tracks all using the same, like, it was just cookie cutter. I go, okay, this is an idea. 
this is an idea. This is another idea. This is an idea. So I just wanted to do like as many ideas as I could to see which idea he liked. Then we would go with that. And it was like, he liked them all. <laughs> I still have a copy of that cassette of my rough, my the beats that I did. And I think I used like a, you know, S1000, um, what did I have? A Korg M1, a, a K, K1, like these really cheap sound modules. Right. That you could break up the MIDI and get like eight sounds out of them. So, like, if you did MIDI channel one, you could put a bass. MIDI channel two, you could put a piano. MIDI channel three. But the sounds were so, I don't know. The, I think the best thing I had was maybe a wave station. But I think it was a, I still have it. Um, M3R was made by, who made that? I think it, who did the M3R? But it was one of the first no multi <laughs> multi timbral synth rack mounts. So like, yeah, that, that thing cost like eight hundred dollars. But I could get eight different instruments out of it by just assigning different channels. Okay. So, you know, I was broke. So all I had was like my drum machine, and I could have eight sounds. So that's like a whole band, really. You know, and that's how I did um, a lot of Malink all of Malenko, you know, in my basement. And when they got signed and they brought the um, A&R guy to uh, Royal Oak is where I had my house. My studio was in the basement. They brought him over to the studio, which was <laughs> just basically a bunch of cinder blocks with boards and keyboards on it. Just, <laughs> the guy seriously thought he was getting punked. Was, oh, wow. Uh, Julian Raymond, who did the Suicide Machines. Yeah, Hollywood um, Records, right? Yeah, yeah. He came, he came to my, my fucking studio, which was really my base, like, uh, basement. And he was like, okay, really? Because we had done the record. He had heard it. Or we, we had most of it done. And he was like, you did not do that record here. You, you didn't. He, was, they, he, wouldn't believe, he did not believe us. He's like, you did not. There's no way you could have made that with this equipment. Um, and I was just like, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> but yes, I did. He couldn't believe it, you know, but that was a technology, you know, ADATS had just come out, which was like the first, you know, poor man's uh, multi-track tape where you would record eight tracks onto a like VCR tape. Yeah. So instead of the days of buying a two inch reel, which was like $150 for 24 tracks, you could just buy an ADAT, which is like two, three grand. And then the tape was like $10 and you got eight tracks. Then you buy another ADAT, you have 16 tracks. You sync them together. And then you can go on from there. You know, you can have five ADAT machines and then each track was eight, eight tracks. So that's how I did it because I didn't have any money. Right. You know what's funny is it makes me think of how nowadays like Billie Eilish is is one of the biggest pop stars and she recorded that I, I know it was like mixed at a professional studio, but the actual tracking of that whole record was done like in her fucking bedroom with her her, oh, her yeah. brother on Logic, you know. So like that's not even frowned upon anymore. That whole home studio thing. There's lots of like platinum artists that are like considered bedroom pop or Dude, like that's how, that's how I did Malenko. It was yeah. in my basement, but I didn't have a computer. Right. I had ADAT tape machines, which I have them right here. Oh, shit. <laughs> Drop my keyboard. Um, <laughs> you know, I have one. I had, you know, I have one ADAT working right now that I can transfer some of the old tapes. Um, but it was a different game. Like now you can do yeah. this shit on your a laptop. Before, right. you know, I had a mixing console, I had a, a shitty Mackie. I mean, I had all garbage. I had a cheap two hundred dollar microphone. <laughs> I mean, Gray Malenko was recorded with no real money, other than from it was real money to me. You know, probably ten, probably twenty, thirty thousand dollars, if that, of gear that I had all on um, credit. You know, oh wow! I would, just make, I would just make payments on it. You know, I'd get the money for the studio time, make payments. So. Um, I was, 
you know, savvy that way with credit. I didn't have money, but I, I knew how to get good credit and buy things on credit and pay them off with uh, doing sessions. And um, with ICP, it was easy to, to pay this stuff off because they were consistent with um, bringing it. And uh, the stuff kept getting so big and they were making so much money. And I just, I didn't really have my business together. You know what I'm saying? Like on my end, I was just kind of like a studio engineer, but really I was a writer and all this stuff. So, you know, everybody's getting new cars and I'm like, Hey, what about me? <laughs> this um, I was thinking about this and you were saying that most of these tracks were made like on budget equipment and made really quickly, but where, how much, after you made these initial tracks and they started tracking over them, were they getting guests like Steve Jones and the fucking Oh, that stuff? didn't see that didn't happen. That once they got signed to Hollywood, Julian Raymond was friends with Steve Jones. Right. And he was friends with Slash. Right. So he just called in those favors. Okay. But what was so, your, what was your mindset thinking? Like, like, you know, you just made these tracks, you kind of whipped them all up. And then now Alice Cooper's doing the intro, yada, yada. Like, what was your mindset during all of this? Well, I'm a huge Sex Pistols fan. So Steve Jones, just being in the same room with Steve Jones is great. The song was already done. It didn't need Steve Jones. Right. <laughs> but Steve Jones is my idol. I would love yeah. it. And then, quite frankly, he put his stuff on there and mixed it, and Joe didn't like it, and we ended up using the um, original one from my basement. Now, ah. it still credits Steve Jones on the fucking record. Okay. But he's no... I mean, I hate to be the bare awful news, but... And I liked what Steve Jones, because like it was Piggy Pie. It was, it's because I don't know how to play guitar. So it's like, <laughs> that's me playing guitar. I don't know how to play. So it's just like, you know, that's Piggy Pie. Steve Jones, which I have his tracks, he put a swing into it. He added more soul. He went, he put like a, and it was cool. It was cool, but it was a little more groovy. And Joe being a rapper, like, you know what? Groovy. He just wanted, uh, you know, which now hindsight, go back to it. I agree with, you know, Joe. Like, yeah, I guess. But it was just for the name, you know, with steak. But I think. And then Slash, I'm like, what the fuck are we getting slammed? Like, I, mean, <laughs> I, I didn't get it. I didn't, like, I'm not, I was never a Guns N' Roses, like, whatever they're great but <laughs> so i mean i don't like great i like shit fucked up i like fucking stooges sex pistols so you were kind of would you say you were kind of well, indifferent I wasn't, no i'm like yeah fuck it i thought it was a fucking comedy i'm like so slash <laughs> is gonna be on a, oh halls of illusion really i can't wait oh i gotta fly to i gotta fly to fucking hollywood and go to a m studios and sit there with slash you know, fuck yeah, I'll do that. What, 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 the, what the fuck else am I going to do? So yeah, I went, I, I was there the whole thing. It was hilarious. Fucking Leaf Garrett was hanging out in the studio. Um, Cause he was friends with, um, I don't know who he was friends with. Right, he was right. there like every day for some reason. And I just remember like, I know Leaf Garrett like crazy because when I was 14, I had this girlfriend for like, I was 14 to 16. And she was psycho. And she fucking loved Leaf Garrett. She had Leaf Garrett posters all over her fucking wall. It was Leaf Garrett, Leaf Garrett, Leaf Garrett albums, Leaf Garrett this, 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 that. So I was, I hated, I fucking hated Leaf Garrett. Then the next thing I know, he's now, what, 15 fucking 20 years later. He's in the green room, and I'm like, oh, I gotta go talk to this motherfucker. And then now he's got the bandana on, you know, he does his, all his beautiful golden hairs gone good. And he was the coolest motherfucker I ever met. Like, he was cracking me up. Like, I loved him. Like, I couldn't hate on him. And I go, dude, I gotta tell you, you were my worst fucking nightmare when I was 14, 15, because my girlfriend was so fucking up your ass. 
And she would just try to make me jealous with Leaf Garrett posters all the time. And she goes, he, and the dumbass thing he says, he's like, yeah, I probably fucked her. I'm like, bitch, she was 14. He's that's like, yeah, I probably that's, that's weird. <laughs> well, he would have been fucking 15, so I guess it could have been okay. Oh, I, oh yeah, he was a teen heartthrob mm-hmm. and all that. So, okay, so the yeah, t- it was like, dude, he was the, it was David Cassidy, Leaf Garrett, blah, 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 all that shit. But so that was, um, you know, 1997, I guess, in, you know, and we're staying at the Roosevelt Hotel, um, which is fucking amazing. We were there for like three weeks. Is, is that I'm the one that Richard Ramirez used to live at? I don't know. It's where like the I Love Lucy show, I think, was recorded at the top of it when oh, they moved okay. to Hollywood. Um, who else stayed? There? Eartha Kitt used to fucking play in the lobby. Oh, wow. Uh, the place is just super famous. It's right across the street from Chinese Man's Theater. Okay, right there on uh, with Hollywood Boulevard. Yeah, yeah. Oh, dude. So, th- I'm co- man, come on, man, dude. That, that was just so amazing. Like staying there, and then we got to hang out with. Uh, we got we met the Cottonmouth Kings. They weren't called Cottonmouth Kings back then. They were called um, Cottonmouth. Yeah, that was just it, Cottonmouth. But they had to change the name because there was a bong. Bong company called Kama. So when they actually did their album, um, they uh, had to change their name to Kama Kings. Pretty sure. But so we we met with those guys because they were friends. Because they the, the guy, some of the guys were in a band called the Humble Gods, which were on Hollywood Records. Yeah. yeah so these yeah. kids were L.A. kids all day. So and they were huge ICP fans. So they fucking take care of us they're just like oh my fucking god you're fucking and i'm like what you know like what they're like oh you're fucking mikey clark i'm like who knows that you know (laughs) but they did no they did so they would just they would take us out man they took us you know they fucking took us to the charlie manson murder house sharon tate's house one night middle of the night we're driving around to go we're gonna take you somewhere we pull up and it's the house fucking where the heinous murders happen you know and they're like you know where you're at i go it looks like Sharon, the sharon Tate house. please tell me and they're like yeah i like it it's just scared the shit out of it but they would just take us to cool shit they took us to a swap meet um you know a mexican swap meet like the flea market and i bought a chihuahua um but those guys were so cool we would go to parties up in the hollywood hills so those guys were great. Brad from Cottonmouth Kings and those all those guys. But they were just little, they were just kids, you know, at that point, you know. Yeah, yeah. Interesting, you know, and they really did good for themselves. So I love those guys. Yeah, they started like a whole, there's like a whole OC kind of subculture that I feel like they and were. They're the- so good. Like their tracks, they're, they're just so good. Like they're, they're, you know, they're really great, you know. I'm really proud of them, man proud to know that's dope so yeah you you go from the laundry room to next thing you know you're in hollywood getting paraded around and yeah hanging yeah out with you slash know, so, and shit yeah so that was kind of um interesting um very interesting i couldn't believe like first of all i couldn't believe hollywood records which was a part of disney was picking this project up i was like this doesn't make sense um how is this gonna work do they know what they're doing? Because we were we were doing so well in Detroit. It was just like, I don't think they did the research. I think they said they could see the numbers that we were moving or they were moving. I wasn't moving shit. Um, they could see all that. So um, they're like, yeah, we got to sign these guys. But the reality is when that record came out and the, the top notches at Disney got whiff of it, they pulled that album the same day it got pulled off the charts. So the record we worked so hard for was, um, canceled. Um, the day it came out, it got canceled. So, cause Disney couldn't fuck with, you know, I don't know. Listen to great Malenko. You could probably figure it out. (laughs) So they couldn't fuck with it. So Joe calls me literally ready to commit suicide. He's devastated. And, um, He's like, everything we work for is over. It's, you know, we don't, we're, we're fucked. We don't have a record. We don't have a label. And I'm like, oh man, oh shit. 
And then, uh, then he calls me back about four or five hours later. Cause he went, he's, he was just going to go to um, Virginia or something just to get the hell out. Cause he, you know, we worked really hard on that for a long time. And he goes, I just got to get out. I'm going to the beach. I'm going away. Fuck the record industry. He gets to Virginia and then all of a sudden all MTV, all the news articles start blowing it up. And then a bidding war starts with like Def Jam, Island, blah, blah, blah. Like all these labels now are offering millions of dollars for this ICP album that Disney just canceled. So then he calls me back, dude, I got to come back home. <laughs> Shit's blowing up. You know, and I'm like, what, what, what? <laughs> so then, yeah, then it was just all over the news. And then that really helped, you know, I guess uh, there's uh, no bad news, you know. So that really blew the record up. But you know what? Fuck it. It's a great record anyway. I think the record would have done good regardless. And uh, dare I say, I think it probably would have gone platinum regardless. Because it's a fucking good record. And you know what? I still make good royalties off that record. It's on Universal, and um, they pay royalties. Um, and thank God for that. And uh, I still see that, you know. So it's crazy, you know. It's crazy. You know, then we, we, we redid the record a little bit. We added a couple of songs just to make the Hollywood record version different, which I don't even know how many of those exist. I got one of them. Yeah. I got yeah. a CD. Yeah. I don't know. So, but, and then that, you know, then it's just like the rest is history from there. Um, but so yeah, really, really exciting shit, you know, that, to be a part of it, you know, sounds like a fucking ride. I, I just remember uh, Joe, did his book but he like read his book and then added a bunch of extra shit and someone on youtube uh posted all of it so it's like joe reading the book and then telling more stories about it for like it's like 15 hours long and at the time i was working at an la rehearsal studio and i was there like eight 12 hours a day babysitting bands and i i, I listened to joe tell the whole story like over like 15 hours of joe talking and uh I was just, it, I could listen I could listen to that guy talk for like literally he would come in the studio every day and just tell stories like he's so amazing um at telling stories it doesn't matter like if he would go to 711 say like we were working in the studio he'd go to 711 to go get some <laughs> fucking fago or whatever the fuck come right. back <laughs> And literally, we'd have to take a half hour break because he'd tell a story about what the fuck just happened. <laughs> because wherever he goes, something. But but he's so observant about his environment, so like he can pull everything together and formulate a story. And then what he's so amazing at, especially on those early records, um, where when he does tell a story, it's like you're watching a movie. You know what I'm saying? Like. You know, like if you listen to Cemetery Girl, it sounds oh fuck. You like it's like you're seeing the movie almost and a lot of those songs. And that's I really his genius. Um he's such a great storyteller, super entertaining. I've never laughed so hard in my life. And you know, it's just like if reality TV could have been around when we were making those records and there could have been a camera inside, I just it you just can't, I can't even explain how fucking funny those guys are. Like, so, so fucking funny. And then I can cut it up, too. I'm, like, 10 years older than those motherfuckers. So they start fucking in, they start in with me, and I can fuck, I can, you know, I can give it back. So the the dynamic between the three of us was so, so great, you know, and so much fun, you know. But Joe's, you know, Joe's, he's, he's a genius, you know, but at this, you know, it's a roller coaster of emotion. So, oh, you can he, tell. Yeah. Oh, he's a roller coaster of emotions. And I tell you what, I could ride that all day where I'm um, listening to him, you know, whatever. If he's just goes through the car wash, I want to hear that fucking story. <laughs> It'll be the best story you've ever heard. And um, there's, like thousands of them that I remember and just 
literally like rolled over crying, laughing. Um, so we had so much fun making, making those records and then seeing like getting a um, response, you know, who, you know, we, we they were just trying to sell some cassette tapes, you know, <laughs> it was like, right. That's how they, they, they were. But what came after it just kept getting bigger and bigger and, um, you know, super cool, you know, glad, I'm glad to be glad I was a part of it, you know, super, super glad. And I think a lot of the stuff holds up, you know, a lot of the tracks I did, um, I'm really proud of, you know, I was real innocent and not knowing what I'm doing, but I had a lot of heart in it. And, uh, I think, you know, they hold up. A lot of times I listen to them and I'm like, I smile, you know, like, and, and uh, I got a lot more left. <laughs> yeah, the, the shit is just raw with personality. Like all, all of the, the samples and the weird, like, uh, I don't know, like fucking weird whistles and stuff and like cartoony noises. You know, it's like it, a lot, some of it has like some Mel Blanc like cartoony like where you know how you're talking about he's telling the story and you could see it in your head i feel like the music really adds to that because when you know they're cutting someone's head off and you hear it go jump or like you know uh, yeah well we you know the use of sound effects and things and and the thing with um being able to work with them and working on that music is like you didn't take it so serious and we didn't have to like oh, well, everyone's doing this, let's do this. Well, if everyone's doing that, let's not do that. Or let's, you know, yeah. just try and, and be weird. Or not try to be, just just not conform to really what um, we were hearing so much. Or if we were going to conform to it, we'd be making fun of it, you know? Um, like the zapper and approach. Those, and with those guys, it was just like, if I, I, I had the total free range to go crazy you know i could do weird i didn't have to try to be cool or try to do like what the coolest shit is like i could just go off the rails and the the weirder i would get the more they would like it and um I remember one time joe like we were, we were gonna start a record and i think it was um and i don't know it might have been um mighty death pop and he goes Mike, I don't want this to sound like anything on the radio. <laughs> and I was like, I could fucking kiss you right now because trying to make shit that sounds like it should be on the radio is so not fun. It's so just boring. And I want to make shit that's not going to be on the radio. Like, you, you know what I mean? Like, th tell me that. Make something that the radio can't play. <laughs> then I'm like, okay, I'm in. Let's do that. I'm punk rock. You know, I don't, you know, I love radio shit too. Don't get me wrong. I'm fucking love, love the radio. I love pop music. I love all that shit. I just don't want to do it. I don't want to try to conform to it. So he goes, just like, do whatever the fuck you want to do. Do what you do. The weirder the better. That was the fucking, that was the meeting. <laughs> and I was just like, yeah, so I can go home and do whatever, you know, make the most fucked up, you know, weird shit. And, uh, you know, that's that's awesome, you know. That's the dream to have carte blanche to fucking just get as weird as you want with it. And, there, and, and I, like the, I like the Mighty Death Pop. I like that record a lot. And uh, I think the song, um, the one with the whistle on it. Oh, uh, anyway, I don't know. I love that that song. Um, I just I like a lot of, you know. I think the bone is on that record, which is just like a surf track. You know, it's just playing like surf music on my guitar, like -na 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 -na, and then just sample it and fucking made a track out of that. Like it just I could go and be so creative with with um working with ICP, um and the weirder, more clowny more fun I would have with the track, the the better it would be, you know? And then, so, you know, they're just genius. Like they could hear it and he would already have a story. Like he, before the, the tracks even, I'm done playing it for him. He already had the whole story mapped out in his head of what it is. And, um, it was, um, match made in heaven, you know, for the, for the most part. 
on a lot of that shit. It was like magic. Felt like, you know. Yeah, and I think it comes through. Um, you were saying that you're not opposed to radio shit. Now, I'm, I'm going to ask you a question. I don't know the answer to this, but that, that Kid Rock song where it's Warren, is it Zevon or Zevin? How do you pronounce that dude's Warren name? Warren Zevon. Warren Zevon. It was uh, Where Was the London? Yeah, and then Sweet Home Alabama, like the mashup. Well, was that was that your idea? Well, I'll tell you how, what happened was um, actually Joe from ICP always liked that song, the Where Was the London? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I kind of forgot about it. And I was in my, what I would do, like I'd get up in the morning, I'd um, drink a cup of coffee, take a Vicodin back then. <laughs> Just been there, one, I've been there. This one, it's just a warm hug, yeah. coffee in the morning. Um, and I had to go to Kid Rock's studio because I was helping him out with his album at the time, right? Um, so he lived out in Clarkston, which is like an hour from me. So I'd get up in the morning. I'd usually work in the studio. Then I'd get my shit together and have to be out at his place by noon. And I'd get up early. So i get up and... If I go to go work on a, a track in the studios, a lot of times, like I have my iTunes, my iTunes library connections, like 20,000 songs of like amazing shit from the forties to, you know, 2010. And I'd put it on random and I'd just look for something that would just inspire me, you know? And that fucking where was the London it was like, hit like dun, 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 dun. and now normally i don't sample shit anymore because i don't need to I, I mean i like to sample but and a lot of times i'll listen to something i go oh i like that they used uh a b3 organ they used uh this type of drum they used this type of i like I'll, I'll i'll listen to something for the instrumentation just so i can stay focused into a particular and i go well, i'm gonna make a song that has the b3 has like those instruments Right. Do you understand yeah. what I'm saying? Because you need limits. If you're going to like paint a picture, you can't have every fucking color. So like a lot of times I'll listen to songs like if I wanted to do whatever kind of type of music, I'll listen to what the kind of production it was this that I like, that I'm feeling. Well, anyway, that fucking played and I go, "Ah, oh, fuck." And I go, "It's too good. I have to sample it." So I sampled the first bar like that's how I took, right? Right, right. Then I put, I found the, um, I did the drum beat, that, ta -da, ta -da, ta -da, ta -da, ta and I added the drum beat with the, ch -ch 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 had that little thing going. And then um, the snare I used <clears throat> was actually the snare from Beat It, I think. Oh, nice. Michael yeah. Jackson snare, but I didn't take Beat It snare. It, I used the snare from the drum machine that Michael Jackson used. But I didn't even know that. Bob told me that like years later. He goes, you know, that's the beat it snare. I'm like, no, I didn't know that. So anyway, <laughs> just so happens. It just so happens. Like, because that's from a um, uh, Lynn drum, I think. No, 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 no. A DX drum machine, I think. Anyway, that snare. That's why Bob loved it. He loves that fucking snare. Anyhow, I do the fucking track, right? And then I put it on CD. And I'm just kind of coming out of my morning coma while I'm driving. <laughs> I'm driving to Kid Rock's house. I get to exit 91 where he, his shit's at. I'm going to work. And I had the fucking CD in my pocket. I put werewolf bite on it because I bit werewolf in London. Yeah, <laughs> you, you bit it. If you sample someone's shit, it's called you bit it. You oh, know, yeah, yeah, it. I know. Yeah. So. I go, oh, let me hear this, because I kind of forgot, like, what, you know, I did it, like, an hour ago, you know, what, what did I do? I put it in there, and it starts in my car, it's like, ba -ba 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 -da 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 -da. and I'm like, holy shit, this is fucking dope! So, I, and I was kind of planning to do that track for uh, a gathering, because the gathering was coming up. I go, well, this be a great summer fun gathering song because they would give a, a song away for free at the gathering yeah yeah kids would come and they give them a free cd so i go oh this could be the free cd maybe i had it in my pocket so i'm in the studio with kid rock we're working on a track that i did this piano track that i did and uh i forget who the producer is he did green day and shit he was there 
and I'm play, you know, we're working on the track that I did, this piano song. He leaves the room to go make a sandwich. I'm getting bored. Bob's on his laptop. I, and I go, Bob, you want to check this out? And I never play anything for Bob because he never will give you your props. Like I can play him the fucking stairway to heaven. And he'd be like, <laughs> oh, it's really long. Uh. <laughs> like, he's just the guy. He's that guy. He's just not going to give you your props. So right, right. I never play him any of my tracks. I don't want to bore him. Whatever. I don't even want to get dissed. Like if I like my shit, I know I like it. So I, I'm like, I shouldn't play this for him, but because he's going to diss it. But fuck him. I put the fucking CD <laughs> in. It plays, right? You know, da 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 And it does the um, chorus, verse, because the verse, I break, broke it down, which is obvious the 16 bar verse part. And he's just sitting there at his laptop, like, oh, huh, yeah, where was London? It's cute. Right, he's doing he just no, 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 no sell, like a, like totally not selling it, like, like it, you know nothing. And I'm listening to it, and it's in the big speakers of the studio, and it's fucking dope. I already know this shit is dope. It's gonna be great at the gathering. So I'm happy. <laughs> I go. I'm going to let it play to the chorus, and let the chorus come back in, and I'm ejecting it and telling him to go suck my dick. So then. Plays, chorus comes back, and then I hit eject, and I put it back in my pocket. And, you know, he doesn't respond. And I'm just like, you dick, that shit was dope. You know it was dope, but you can't give me no fucking props. Fuck you. I knew I shouldn't have played you anything. I knew it. Um, Then, then, I would start working on the, the stupid-ass piano track that I, I had up. And he's walking around the studio, he's like, and he's all flustered. I go, what the fuck's your problem? What's, what's going on? He goes, um, I can't get that. I can't get that out of my head. What you just played me. I go, what the werewolf bite? Werewolf bite right here? He goes, yeah, put that back in. I'm like, oh, really, dude? Now you want to hear it again? You just like, you would give me no props. And now you want to hear it again. Yeah, put that back in. I put it back in, right? It starts playing. That dude walks in. Um, I fucking... He's a huge fucking producer. Green Day dude. I don't fucking know. He comes in. He goes, what the fuck is this? <laughs> and Bob, you know, Bob's like, oh, it's Clark did. Clark did something Clark did. And then the dude goes, who the fuck are you? Because <laughs> <laughs> he just left and it was already a dope track that I did that we were working on that never even got used. I don't know, whatever. But, and I just like, I just look at him and I go, Google me, you know. I had enough history. Nice. <laughs> Tell you, you were like, Google me. <laughs> Google me. You. So then, you know, he he talks me into going back home and getting the tracks, and then the uh, rest is history. Then that thing blew up. Yeah, dude. Real quick, when uh, I was working at a catering company in Shelby Township, when that song broke, that whatever summer it was, I forget what fucking year it was, and every single white girl working at that place smoking menthol cigarettes uh, was just dancing and be like, "We were uh, trying funny things." Because, but cause, you know, like I haven't heard that song in like years because you know since I quit the tour, which was in um, early, I don't know when it was, 2019, late 18, I don't know what it was, right? But it's been, you know. And I just heard it up here in one of the bars because, you know, the quarantine, we, we didn't know what's been going on, but went someplace and it played. And it was so fucking annoying. Like I couldn't do, I could, I, I, I literally, <laughs> I had to like get out of there. I couldn't <laughs> listen. It's like everything about it. Just like, I don't know. I, <laughs> I don't know what about it. It just sent me through the roof or I just like, <laughs> I gotta get out of here. I can't deal with this song. So, but going yeah. going back That's, to you know you don't want to listen to your own shit even if it's just a bite. Yeah, but but anyway, so what happened though? How the Sweet Home Alabama thing came out? Like so, when I put the CD back in, Bob's obsessed with Sweet Home and Leonard Skinner and Sweet Home Alabama. He's obsessed with that shit, of course. Uh, so I put that shit in, and he's walking around, and he's taking it in and then he picks up the guitar he's like 
this is the same fucking structure as Sweet Home Alabama. <laughs> like, what? And then he starts playing Sweet Home Alabama on the guitar over it. And I'm like, oh, my God. Oh, and, and also, immediately, immediately, he started doing that. Like, he's walking around the control room the second time I put the CD in. And, like, immediately, because what how he writes, he scats. He scats it right. to get and then figures out how to put the lyrics into the the, the rhythm because you kind of you get your um, your rhythm for the how your cadence or how where where you want to hit your 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 um, your 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 consonants or you know so he was just like na 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 he starts doing that like exactly just how it's on the right and I was like dude that's the shit <laughs> like I could tell like it was amazing. Do you know what I mean? Like, it was really good. Like, just what he was scatting. And he's like, you gotta go back. You gotta go back home. So I had to drive back all the way back to Sterling Heights. Fucking 45 hour minute, hour drive to go get the, the Pro Tool session and come all the way back. But I did. And I was like, can we just cut to the two track? I don't want to go all the way back to Sterling Heights. Just, well, I'll bring it back tomorrow. I'm coming back tomorrow. We'll do, no. And he was like, no, no, you got to go get it now. You got to get it now. They go, I'm going to be here tomorrow. But he was animate, which he was smart, you know. He was smart. And yeah, it, that song just blew the fuck up, you know. I didn't know it would. I didn't know it would. That's like the, the jobber noonie fucking, you know, Macomb County Anthem. You know, it's just, you know, when you're signing the contracts and doing all that shit, you just wish you would have known, you know, because you would have just like, oh, shit. Oh, yeah. I mean, oh, but it is what it is, you know. At least I, I, well, I didn't, I don't think he put my name on it. That's the that's that's the kicker like that. Oh hurts. damn! Yikes! Yeah, like I I brought that. That's that wouldn't even happen. But and then when you just you don't even get you know it gets I don't know. It's sad. I, like my, but my name's not like go look on the greatest hits record. My name's not on it. Um, on the album it came on. I don't think I don't think you can find my name. Oh damn! I, have, I, I didn't know production. that. I don't have production credit on it and nothing like that. So that hurt really bad, you know, um, hurt really bad because at the end of the day, you know, what would that have, would that have taken away from anything if I was, you know, I don't know if I would have brought you that, would you, would you have gave, would you put my name on the record? Of course. <laughs> So that hurt. That's that's a hard. That's a hard pill to swallow. But then at the end of the day, you just have to uh, move on. Because if I if I was going to uh, beat myself up over um, all the um, things that didn't go right, um, I would be a drug addict. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, feel that a raging alcoholic. Like you just have to like accept some of the things. You know, life is not not fair. So. Um, there are people that will, uh, get over, you know, you know, you, you just have to be real careful. You know, you gotta, you gotta be careful. And, um, I'm not always very careful. So, but it is what it is. I'm proud, happy and got skills still, I'm still alive. Fucking a dude. Yeah. Well, it's like, so I'm going to take my shirt off if you want to. No, that would be that would end the interview. It'd be nasty. Hey, it's, I just, I, I'm getting um, bo. I'm in this small room and yeah, my bo smells like onions. It's bad, but I didn't know that part of the story because I <laughs> I forget who told me about the the Warren Zevon thing, and that was you. I had no idea you didn't get credit on it, man. That that stings, dude. I'm so I'm sorry if I brought that up. I, I just I just wanted to hear the story, you know. Oh no, I don't. I'm, I'm, I'm. A, I mean, I understand what I understand why I know what happened. I um, right, and it was my fault that I didn't have the um, paperwork right. You know, the, the, you, like you have to really look at the paperwork, the the contracts, what you're being handed. But I mean, Bob and I go back. You know, 
1990, yeah, 89, yeah. you know, like I've been with that guy forever. So, you know, I didn't see it coming, but when I got the record and go, you know, I'm all proud and happy and you start going through like, whoa, wait, I thought for sure, I thought for sure I did that. I thought for sure I brought you that fucking track. So it's just, it sucks, but it's the whole Rick, you know, I could go on and on and on about the, the horrors. So if anybody's out there and you're starting out and you're making music, you're making tracks, you're doing all this shit, um, call me because I could probably fucking tell you some mistakes not to make yeah, like what not to do simple 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 mistakes that like you know i would be a millionaire i would be like a millionaire like 10 times over hadn't i just done these little things but you know sometimes you know it's uh it is what it is you know and all those guys in motown like you know a lot of those those cats you know my story is not as bad as a lot of people's story, you know? So I did, did okay. But, you know, a lot of people that just made some phone calls did a lot better just because they were more savvy with how to uh, manipulate um, artists or, you know, creative people where, you know, it's coming from my heart, you know, I'm not a attorney, you know, and, they can, they can get you, boy. They can get you. And for many years, from 2000, when I quit ICP for the first time, for like five years, I was really salty. And I was very upset um, because of, um, you know, everybody got rich and, I was, you know, you're still broke. That's a hard pill to swallow. But then you have to let it go because it was starting to, to eat me, kill me where I was, uh, and then I got a really good manager and he said, listen, you can't count other people's money. They've got the money. You fucked up, you know? So you have to let it go. And once I was able to like let go of um, the losses and uh, then I, I kind of was free and then I got more healthy. But you will, uh, it can kill you um, to get a bad record deal, especially if it's a hit, you know. And it has, it has killed, um, you know, it has fucked up a lot of artists and made them angry. Um, <laughs> Van Morrison, like the, 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 that Gloria story with her brown eyed girl story or whatever, like it goes on and on way, be, way before me, way before me, um, that cats who have um, been, you know, writers, producers, or whatever, um, got put in a trick bag, you know, and had a great hit, but didn't make no money <laughs> from it. So um, that's, that's, uh, you got to move on. You got to let it go. Like, that's not your money, you know, and fuck it. I don't need money. I got me. But I got another fucking interview. I haven't done an interview in like fucking five, ten years, and now yeah. I got two in one night. Oh, you got okay. You got another one tonight, huh? All right. Yeah, but if you want to do this again, I'm down. I love talking to you, Neil. You well, know, I'm a fucking fan. Not only a friend, I'm a fan. Oh, that means the world to me, man. Like, uh, you know, like I said, I was just a little kid, and those records they changed my brain in a way. So, um, whether or not you can listen back and be like, "This is the shit," like. It I can now. Now it's a little bit like the, all the vinyl came out. So I yeah. went on Amazon and I, I bought like all the vinyl, ICP vinyl that um, all the records that I did. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so I will listen to them and they make, you know, it's kind of makes me laugh and smile. I'm like, whoa, whoa, where was I at then or whatever. Plus I have like, you know, tons of archives of stuff, which I'm going through. So I want to, um, put some remixes together, maybe do another murder mix. Um, I released a bunch of shit on MikeClark.com that I'm, I did, um, which is cool. And uh, so I'm glad to get back in the studio, get have all my stuff hooked up and uh, 
got a lot of ideas and I got a lot of stuff in the can still that I'm excited to uh, go through, you know? And uh, so going through all my archives, you know, I've got thousands, thousands of CDs. I've been finding downtown Brown CDs <laughs> from probably the first day you've given it to me. So, cause I keep everything. Like if anybody gives me a CD, I have it. It's in the archive. So, Dude, I think I found like five or six downtown Brown CDs. Oh, I was always floating shit your way because. Uh, yeah, well, yeah. I have them. Like, and it's so funny because like, I did. I did like a couple months ago. I did all my cassettes, like all the boxes. It took me like two weeks to go through all the cassettes, figure out what I want to deal with, what it's garbage. And now I'm at my CD phase, and so it's funny this um, finding those CDs, which I'm excited about. And um, checking those out. Then next is my 45. I have a 45 collection, which is like insane. Like all punk rock 45s that are worth like a lot of money. So I'm going to probably get on, you know, eBay or Discogs and start fucking selling this shit. I got Misfits 45s and, you know, shit's worth like a lot of money. <laughs> oh, yeah. Damn. Yeah. So I'm going to sell that shit and buy crypto. You know? I'm doing the same thing with my comic books. I found all my comic <laughs> Yeah, dude, crypto fucking what did it hit today, man? It it tanked. Oh man, I was cracking up. Uh, Bitcoin went down to like forty three thousand or whatever. Oh, that's I like that's that's big. Ooh, dude, it tanked so bad, and it's cracking me up because I don't have much invested, you know, in any of that. But but what I did invest, <laughs> I doubled my money. Well, there you okay. go. Bitcoin's at 45500 $45, right now but it was up to sixty nine thousand dollars yeah that's like 25 grand differences but i've been buying them shit coins you know and trying you know like you know two dollars two dollars here whatever and then they go up to like seven eight dollars and then you fucking cash out you know you spend a thousand dollars on a dollar stock and it goes up eight hundred percent you just made eight thousand dollars fuck it yeah and then you get in and get the fuck out well, you know, it goes the other way too. <laughs> like, oh yeah, yeah. It, it goes the other way, probably more, more than you know, than the other way. But it's interesting. Like this whole new digital money technology is kind of like you know the way it, you know when music went digital, this and that. I think this is just the last thing to go. Um, I don't know, man. I think it's still ground floor, man. The way I look at it is if they get rid of physical money altogether, then I would be stupid not to dump a little bit of money into the shit just in case, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it's it's crazy. Like, my friend Tommy was trying to get me to buy into some crypto, like, in 2017, you know? And it was like, I don't know, $8,000 a share. And I just, like, that's or not even like $3,000 a share. I just thought that like, that's too much money to spend. Yeah. Now fast forward, like last month, it's $69,000 a share. I'm just like, God damn it. If I would have fucking thrown $5,000 at it, I'd be fucking, uh, it's, it's hard to look into, the you know, that's the shit would have all the time. Cause I guarantee if it would have hit 20,000, I would have sold that shit. Yeah. So I probably wouldn't have kept it till it went to 60,000 anyway. So, but anyway, it's it's back down today. But it's a roller coaster, man. Well, it's a, it's fun, but it's great talking to you. And uh, yeah, if you want to do this again, maybe uh, check back with me in like six months because I know a lot of things are going to change around here. I'm going to have a lot more music that uh, I want to. Um, I'll be excited about. Yeah, I want to hear George Clinton's stories. I, I yeah, I, oh. <laughs> I could, dude. I could talk to you for like four hours and shit. So. <laughs> Oh my God, that's a whole nother book, dude. I guess that's what I'm saying. I spent like three years with that guy. It was so much fun. That's like, what that I'm saying. I, just, I, I fucking love him so fucking much. I learned so much from him. I could go, oh my God. Oh my God. And that was kind of before, that's way before Kid Rock hit. That's uh, kind of before. You know, that was 92, 93, 94. That's why when the ICP stuff was starting to um, happen around, you know, Detroit area and stuff. But, um, oh, my God, I have some funny fucking stories. Some great stories. I'm today. with it, man. I just, I love, loved him. And uh, 
it was the dynamic between us was really hysterical because I didn't know a lot about, you know, I was just a punk kid. And I think he liked that because I didn't, um, I wasn't in awe of him thinking he was this God that he was. Right. <laughs> I just didn't know. I was just doing my thing, doing my thing and programming beats with him. He just fucking loved me. He really, really took on to me. And now looking back at it, I go, wow, what an honor. What an honor to have somebody like that um, fucking thinking you're the shit, you know? I have to rethink that, you know? But yeah, but it's good to be back. You know, like I said, it's like I haven't done, I haven't done an interview in probably five, ten years, and I haven't really wanted to. I haven't really had anything to say. But I love you, Neil, and um, love you, man. You asked me a while, so I go. You know what? This would be fun to talk to you. Um, and uh, I'm sure we didn't get through half of what you might have wanted to talk about. No, but it's great because I, I feel like every time I do one of these podcasts, I get a little bit of nugget. Uh, of uh, inspiration and and with this conversation like more specifically uh, the not being salty and the the gratitude thing it's just it, it's cool when I talk to people that I respect that are a little bit further ahead than me in life and they're just like yeah you you gotta just let that shit go and don't beat yourself up so much it, it emboldens my sense of me wanting to do that for me so I appreciate those nuggets man well, you have you have a great talent about you know you have a, a great talent that a lot of people don't have, and you have to really understand, um, and just you know just look right now into right right don't don't get too far in your head. You know you you you're blessed. You know you Absolutely. are you're you're incredible incredible talent. Like just your live show, um, just you're 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 one of a kind you know you really are so oh, thanks man um eee. you are you know um so don't don't beat yourself up you know let other people are gonna do that anyway you know, fuck them. <laughs> yeah dude I'm just saying <laughs> you, should, you don't need to do it you know be thanks, kind man. to yourself it's uh you know it's all you got and you know love you Love you too, man. Yeah, we, let's cut so, it. You know, throw part one on this. You know, say this is part one because, like, you know, if you want to talk some more, man, I got, I could go probably three, four chapters. <laughs> we go into the George Clinton shit. You go a lot. That's what I'm saying, man. I know you got more stories, so I appreciate you being <laughs> on part one. And I talked a lot. You know, like I go off on tangents. That's like, good. I'm out of my fucking mind, so. It makes my job easy because a lot of times, you know, you'll ask a question, you'll get a one-word answer, and then you just sit there with your thumb up your ass. I talk, I talk too much, which is my problem. You know, I say too much. You know, I probably, I don't know what I said, but I probably got myself in some trouble. I don't give a fuck. Because really right now, I'm done. You know, I fucking won the game. I'm up on my compound. I'm in the yeah. fucking national here in forest. I don't, I don't, I'm not going to be going to an airport ever again. I'm not going to fucking be doing shows i'm not doing nothing i'm here right here right now doing what the fuck i want when i want and uh i got a greenhouse i got a wood shop i got a i can melt glass i got an art studio and i got a fucking recording studio five dog or three dogs and five cats like what else fucking that's done. lovely that's lovely fucking done and you know what when you get a chance bring you and your girl up here i got a cabin i got Fucking two cabins on the lake. Get your fucking ass up here. You got any pets? You got dogs? No dogs. It's just a cat. She has to stay here. Oh, okay. If you got dogs, bring them. Um, it's, uh, you won't want to leave. And oh. we will fucking make noise. We'll make, we'll record some shit. Yeah, let's get weird. I'm, I, I would love oh, that. Oh, dude. I love making noise. I love making noise. Let's do it. I got a lot of fucking noise makers here, man. Well, yeah, a lot of things. Now that the the COVID thing, it, it, like people are vaccinated, the, the the fear is dying down. I'm I'm totally with it, man. I'm I'm ready to get the fuck out and do some cool shit. Yeah, I'm all, we're all vaxxed up over here, so. Woo! Yeah, so. All right, well, Mikey Clark, I'm gonna let you go, but I appreciate this, and I'm looking forward to more stories. And and yeah, it's nice catching right. up. 
Well, edit it however you want. Cut out all of whatever bullshit. And, uh, Nothing. I'm keeping it all. It'll be like five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> so okay. Well, I got. I'm gonna go back to the house and get a drink. My, I gotta walk all the way to the house. Is like way up the fucking driveway, and I, I got a golf cart though. Compound, bro. I'm gonna go. Yeah, dude. You gotta. You gotta get out here, man. I think uh, you will like it. Can you play drums? No, I suck at drums. I could play. Uh, okay. I could play bass, I keyboard. Yeah, I got. I got, I know a guy. I know a few guys hooked up, and I can't play drums, and I I haven't even been able to record or get. I don't even know what it's gonna sound like. They're in this room right here, and I'm like, my other studio had such a kick ass drum room. Um, this is not a drum room, but I got it. You know, I got it. I think it might sound okay, but I'm dying to know. I mean, I, I get play. I get hit shit, and you can record that, but I'm not. I can't make a beat that well. <laughs> uh, we'll figure it out. Okay, well, I'll talk to you sooner than later. Mikey Clark, thanks, dude. I right, love you, man. Love you too. Be good. We'll talk soon. All right, thanks. Peace.